Thank you, Peggy. I invite your attention to Romans chapter 6 today, verses 15 through 23. What then, are we to continue or are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once yielded your members to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now yield your members to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But then what return did you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the return you get is sanctification and in its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's been a couple of weeks now since we've been in the book of Romans, so it might be well just for a moment to refresh ourselves in the context of the scripture. Throughout this book, Paul is presenting to us the way that God has reached us and made us acceptable in God's eyes. We have been found unworthy. The early part of the letter deals with that unworthiness. All of sin had come short. From chapter 3, verse 21 through chapter 5, Paul presented us the great theme. The Christ has taken our punishment, the penalty that was due us for sin. He bore. And if we will allow him to accept our punishment, we may go free. This is God's grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Once having found that freedom in Christ, chapter 6 begins by relating to us how now we are to live as Christians. We find, for example, that chapter 6 deals with the theme that we are still as Christians struggling with the question of sin and with the problem of sin. Chapter 7, we are still struggling with the law and its demands. Chapter 8, we have the liberty and the blessing of the Spirit of God. As Paul begins chapter 6, he asks a question which almost word for word is repeated in verse 15. There is a slight nuance of difference. Both of the questions come at the theme of the believer and the question or the problem of sin. Now, if you as a believer in Jesus Christ are not bothered at all by sin, if you are now living in a stainless uh, uh, environment so that uh, you are not tempted nor do you yield to temptation, this uh, sermon today is going to have very little relevance uh, for you. If you get hassled from time to time and fail from time to time in your walk with the Lord and become discouraged, then what Paul is saying here has immense relevance. In verse 1 of chapter 6, he approaches the question this way, Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? If I were you, I'd underline the word continue. Are we to continue in it? Because what Paul is referring to in the first half of chapter 6 is a perpetual condition of sin. In effect, he's saying, if a person has come to Jesus Christ, can they remain unchanged? Is all that there is is believing to Jesus, uh, acceptance of a creedal statement? I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose again from the dead. Is that all there is? Does one simply have to say this? Check a a question and answer, a true-false, a multiple-choice test like you do in school, answer the question correctly and you go on your way? Or does it involve more than that? If it's just checking something off, then no change is required. One can be what he was after what he was before. Is this the way we are to handle grace? Having not earned salvation, but having been given it freely, are we now to simply say, it's all God and we have no responsibilities towards God? Are we to continue in sin? Paul's flat answer throughout that whole first part of chapter 6 is is by no means. This, This couldn't be the case. A person's life who remains unchanged after confessing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord calls into question his statement of faith because faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is more than intellectually believing something. It is putting his life on the line. It is the total committal of self. It is relying completely upon Jesus Christ. 
Once that complete reliance is there, then life inevitably has to change. And it's exciting to realize that one of the great dynamics of the gospel and of the kingdom of God is that when we come to Christ, we do not remain static, we do not vegetate, we do not just sit around like a bump on a log until eternity rolls around and hopefully then we're ready to walk into eternity, but we grow. The gospel calls for the, if I get the word right, the dynamic development of our personality. So are we to continue in sin? No. Then verse 15, are we to sin? Notice the word continue here is dropped. There appears to be a slight change in nuance, and it's now Paul is raising the question, well, okay, we know we're not to continue in sin, but how about every once in a while? <laughs> Have you uh, faced uh, the, the problem in your own life that you were set up with a temptation, and uh, you, you came into it and you said, well, boy, that temptation sure looks uh, enticing. Should I do it? or Well, I know I should be obedient to God on that, but I know God is full of grace, too. And I think I can go ahead and do that because when I come around to it, I can count on God's grace. He's going to bail me out. So we dive into sin on the basis that God is full of grace. This is the kind of thing Paul is approaching then in this question. Are we to approach sin from the standpoint, well, God's full of grace, go ahead and do it. How do we, how do we come into that kind of philosophy or mentality that, uh, that sometimes creeps up now in our Christian life? Maybe even, at times, rather seems to be predominant. In these verses, 15 through 23, Paul really presents kind of three courses of action that we are to take in respect to this question, are we to sin? The first thing he does, through the use of the phrase, by no means, he first of all rejects the argument of cheap grace. Cheap grace is grace which calls for belief without commitment. It calls for us to be forgiven without our needing to repent, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his, in his book on the cost of discipleship where he coined the phrase cheap grace. Are we to continue in cheap grace simply saying, well, I'm glad now I have the fire insurance policy and I'll do what I will. Are we to continue or are we to sin? By no means. On a logical level, that whole philosophy of reasoning is to be rejected. It is anathema. It's unacceptable to the renewed Christian mind. And notice how many times already in Romans, Paul has approached us at the level of our thinking. I think we too often feel that our belief should only come to us at the level of our feelings, our emotions. And thank God, he does come to us at those levels. But if he comes to us only at how we feel and we emote, we negate and neglect one of the most vital areas that God wants to come to us, and that is in the renewing of our mind. And so he's calling us to think and he's calling us to logically reject a pattern of thinking which says God's grace is so great I'll go ahead and call to account. It's like cashing in a credit card. I know that there's the money that American Express has there so I'll try out and see how much they have. <laughs> reject the argument of cheap grace. Why? Because you have an owner. You are a slave to someone. You belong. That's the second employ argument that he employs. You have now come into a new relationship. You once were slaves to sin, but now you are slaves to righteousness and obedience. Indeed, yes, you are slaves to God. You have a new owner. I got a fresh perception of this factor of being owned by a little incident that happened yesterday. We were out at Desert Hot Springs in a leadership retreat with our uh, singles leadership group in the church, the uncouples. And uh, by the way, just let me throw in a, a plug here if I could stop for just a moment because it has been our conviction in the church that we ought not to simply minister to any one segment of the community. The church should be alive with ministry to the totality of people that make up our community. And uh, we recognize that there are a great many singles or uncouples that, that are in Newport Mesa and other areas that are nearby from which you come. And therefore, we try to avoid terms like calling this a family church. We hope that people with families find that their needs for a family are being met, but we recognize there are people that come to the church and, are, and the, whom the Lord loves and accepts uh, just as much as a family person, and that's singles, you know. That's an uh, acceptable calling of life, to be single. And so uh, we, we, I'm just so thrilled with what is going on in the singles area of the church. 
and the development that is and the maturity that is that is just keeps coming and the steadiness and the growing ministry. It's just really we've had a great time, but that's not what I wanted to tell you. I just not threw that in. Uh, we have a dog, which some of you are aware of, because I've used it in sermon illustrations before, and it's a, he is a treasure trove of sermon illustrations. <laughs> His name is Boomer. He's an 11-year-old white French poodle that has been with us before we even had our, our children. In fact, I'd recommend for young married couples that are here that haven't had children yet to get a dog first, because uh, you make all the mistakes on the dog, and then the children turn out perfect, such as ours are. <laughs> Boomer is kind of a miracle dog. He has, been, he has been lost and run away many times, but always been found. He is the prodigal prodigal. And yesterday afternoon, uh, when I went to check in the room on him, he was gone. One of the kids had accidentally left the door open, and out he had gone. He has no sense of belonging. No, no, no tie at all. He's just gone. Now, he's 11 years old, and in dog age, that's uh, getting up there. And uh, he doesn't quite have the strength he used to, and also we found he really gets short of breath and when he pants hard he just heaves and just seems like he's having a heart attack and we thought, oh no, he's out in the desert and for sure now this is the end. So we mobilized the family, we finally mobilized the singles that were there and there were about a dozen of us combing the streets of Desert Hot Springs looking for this little white dog that had gotten out called Boomer. Every kid in town that could be spotted was promised $5 to be found. So we literally had the whole town, the radio station was even called. And... Finally, after about two hours of the desert heat, we, we were convinced that, at least I became convinced, this is the time that Boomer has run out of miracles. He has really had it this time. And Jewel, who's always the last one in on these roundups, because she has the true shepherd's heart, is, is out looking. And on her last try, at her last stop, could you believe she discovered him? And he came back to the room. Well, that doesn't mean anything to him. If, if, if five minutes after being brought back, I had left the door open again, he would have run out and disappeared again. And that is the same whether we're in a motel or at our house. He has no sense of direction, no sense of belonging. All of these years, we have fed that dog, <laughs> cow can no less. We have loved that dog. We have washed that dog, combed that dog, loved that dog. Just been everything that people can be to a dog. And he still has no sense of belonging. Let him out and go his own way. And I thought, wow, what a figure. That, that appears to be here what Paul is talking about in regard to ownership. That, uh, that the mark of a believer is that, is that they know into whose home they have been brought. They know the Father's house. They, do, they, have, they have lost that instinct to wander off and do their own thing. And simply leave it up to the owner, God, to come out and find them. Let him expend himself. But now there is a honing in the heart that keeps wanting to come home. Wanting to be in the Father's house. And indeed is in the Father's house. So that when the Christian strays, he knows it. He knows he's away. And he knows how to get back. There is a terrible song in our hymnal. The song is good except for the third verse. It is... Um, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. That's okay. That's a beautiful song. First verse is fine. Second verse is fine. Third verse, in exalting the grace of God, does an incredible thing. It, it uses the refrain, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's Boomer. <laughs> prone to leave the one he loves. How, how would you husbands get away with it? If you, as you kiss your wife goodbye in the morning... And you said to her, prone to wonder, honey, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. Sometimes I wonder what God does when he listens to some of our hymns. And he, yeah, they really know what they're singing to me today, you know. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. No longer prone to wonder, but found. We have come in under new ownership. Now, Paul apologizes for the employment of the illustration of slavery. He recognizes that any illustration has limits. You can only press the truth so far and carry to an extreme, this analogy will not yield truth. So he says in verse 19, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. That is, there's something about slavery that he wants to use as an illustration, but there's much in slavery that he would repudiate. And since many in his audience were themselves slaves, or, and, knew firsthand the conditions of slavery, 
that indeed one's time was not his own. It's not like working today and you work eight hours at a job and then your time is your own at night, you can do what you want. The slave was owned all the time, totally under the domination of, of his master. And Paul is saying there's something about that that can be transferred to the Christian life. Where the analogy breaks down is that God is not like the, the slave owner that keeps you in the feeling of fear and bondage and oppression. But in terms of actually owning and belonging and yielding yourselves and not being your own person, that is how you are to approach the question of sin and obedience. You are to yield yourself to God in obedience. If we were using a modern analogy, we might simply say, for example, that you could have uh, a great deal of, of, of freedom up here if you came to the piano and you don't know how to play and you just you know, play any key on the piano. But your freedom is not near what Marilyn's freedom is when she sits down to play because she has gone through the discipline of learning how to get everything together so that out comes this beautiful piece of music. My freedom on the piano is nothing like hers. My freedom is actually bondage because I never endured discipline. And Paul uses this amazing paradox by saying if you want true freedom in life, freedom does not come by self-freedom. Freedom comes by becoming slaves to God. Paul approaches the question of sin in the believer's life by starting out with the premise we have died to sin. That's our salvation. We were, we were in the cross with Christ. We were in the tomb with Christ. We were raised with Christ. So the question of our salvation is settled. But that having been settled, he next tells us what to do with the residual effect of sin that now is no longer dominating us. It's no longer on top of us. Through Christ, we're on top of it, but it's still around warring in our members and attempting to work itself out. As we noted two weeks ago, Paul's solution is not to cast out sin. There's no exorcism of sin. Gather together and cast it out. And you won't have to worry about it anymore. You can't cast it out in that way. Nor does Paul say, for example, have an additional spiritual experience. What you need is some additional spiritual experience to defeat sin. So therefore, pray through it. Now, that's not to denigrate or to devalue prayer. That's important, or spiritual experience. But his way of coming to grips with sin is to, to, uh, to come to us at the level of our will and of our intelligence and to say, recognize who you are, first of all, and then yield your members, your body, the way you express yourself. That's members. Yield your members to, as instruments for righteousness unto God. Even as you yielded yourself once to greater and greater iniquity, and you didn't do that passively, you didn't sin passively, so don't wait around passively to be sanctified or to be made holy in God's presence. Be active about it. Pursue it. Bring your will and your diligence to bear on the question of, be ye therefore perfect as I am perfect. The word of the Lord to us. So we are to yield to obey. To not pass off responsibility to others but to actively and aggressively fight the remaining effect of sin that is in our lives, knowing that in Christ we've already won the victory and we're now in the mopping up operations. It's very active warfare, though. I ran across uh, this week a humorous little story of, a, of an Indian who had, on a reservation who had just been saved and was expressing in his, uh, his limited context of language what it was like now that he had found Christ and was living the Christian life. He said... It, he said, in me I find two dogs. He said, one is black and is all the time mean, fight, fight, fight. And the other dog is white and is all the time pure and is full of peace. And he said, these two dogs scrap all the time. They war. <laughs> and the one said, uh, which one is winning? And he responded, whichever dog I say sick him to. <laughs> <laughs> This is tremendously true of what we are feeding in our lives. Whatever we are saying, sick them to in terms of our thought life and our actions, that is what is growing and developing. And sin is the kind of experience that is never satisfied to just simply lie uh, static on a, on a given plane. It is always driving us deeper and deeper, requiring more and more and giving less and less. You yielded yourself, Paul says, to greater and greater iniquity. So now in the Christian life, we have the opportunity to grow, to yield ourselves conversely to greater and greater righteousness. Recognizing that, that there's a little bit of mystery here. Already in Christ, we have been made righteous. Already in Christ, we have been freed from sin. That is our justification. As God looks at me, he sees no sin. I am perfect because I am in Christ. But in human terms, as I look at myself, my picture is not yet where God is. Through faith it is there, but in actual fact I find myself from time to time at war with my members. No longer the real me, 
But that's what used to be the old me that's still there wanting to express itself in sinful ways. And to get, to get that element of me put down is a process called sanctification, a being made holy. And sanctification has to be that which is desired. You have, to, If you're going to really serve Christ with a whole heart and become perfectly disciplined and obedient to Him as we all would want to be, and none of us have, are not yet there if we're really honest with ourselves, we, but the desire must be there. You cannot do anything if the desire is not there and somebody else can't make you have the desire. And I don't know how to awaken that in you. I, I don't know. You just need to be responsive to the Spirit who's suggesting that you have the desire to be perfect as the Father. Yesterday we were watching a father trying to teach his daughter how to swim in the motel swimming pool. She was about five or six years of age. And uh, it, was a, it was the most incredible scene. Everybody was getting out of the pool. They just couldn't stand what was happening. Uh, people were talking about it on the sidelines and everything. His father decided evidently this was the day his daughter was going to learn to swim. And he was going to teach her how, whether she wanted to learn or not. So he took her, first of all, and helped throw her into the pool so she'd get the feel of the water. That was important. She'd get her head under the water, I guess. Then he got into water with her and just was forcing her, you know, let go of her and she'd be out in water over her head and she'd be screaming her head off and struggling and everything. And uh, then after she'd done that for a while, he'd let her get to the edge for a moment's rest. And one time she got to the edge, she grabbed hold, and she tried to pull herself out. She said, Daddy, please let me out of here. And he was, he was going to teach her to swim, though. Boom! Grabbed her back in the middle of the pool. You know, she's going to learn to swim. Well, that, uh, that child's going to have real problems, I think, with water <laughs> as she grows up. She's probably, uh, well, she's, she's, unless she doesn't get a good teacher right away, she's not going to be a good swimmer because the inbred fear is going to be too deep. It was not handled well. And sometimes sanctification is not handled by the church really well. Uh, people such as myself, people that teach the Scripture, or other Christians, may, in their desire to get you to respond in holiness, uh, say things to you that are like that daughter trying to get his, or that father trying to get his child into the pool, and scare you so half to death in regard to sanctification or holiness, that you say, man, if that is what sanctification or holiness is, for, leave me out. Instead of being a liberating experience, sanctification or holiness almost becomes a dirty word. A bad word, something not to be desired. When, it, when to be holy is to be healthy, it's to be well. It's to be what God wants us to be. It's the best thing in the world to be. And that has to be desired. We need to recognize that as human beings, we come in under bondage. We're none of us totally free. No one is the captain of his own ship. We have two alternatives. We are a slave to sin or we are a slave to God. You say, boy, that's rather narrow, as Paul Evans said in his prayer this morning about Jesus. You know, that's rather narrow. Does it really come down to that? What about good people? Now, Paul, can you honestly uh, say that good people are slaves to sin as well? What about moral, outstanding citizens who, who raise families, who are involved in community efforts, who pay their bills, pay their taxes, uh, contribute to the uh, welfare of the community and the like? Uh, aren't you really pressing the point a little bit? And really, if we understand what the message of Jesus is and what the message of, of the apostles is, we learn that uh, even good people have a righteousness that is unacceptable to God. Because there is only one righteousness, there's only one life that was ever lived, that was ever acceptable to God. And that is the life of Jesus Christ, who fully met all the demands of God. Only His life is acceptable. Every other life is not. No matter how near it's come to His, it is still not acceptable. And if we want the approval of God and the righteousness of God, we do not earn our own. We accept it from Him, no matter how good we may say ourselves to be or think of ourselves. Romans 10.3 puts the issue rather pointedly. For being ignorant, Paul is talking about the person who's trying to stand in their own righteousness rather than relying completely upon Jesus Christ for salvation. Being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to His. What happens when a person like Saul of Tarsus, who, other than his persecuting activities toward the Christian, was in every way a moral and a decent person? What happens when he comes to Jesus Christ? He says in Philippians chapter 3, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse or dung in order that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, based on the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, 
the righteousness from God that depends upon faith. And our Lord himself said in Luke 16, 15, to the Pharisees, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Paul says in Romans, There is none righteous, no, not one. He who is seeking to establish his own righteousness has not the righteousness of God, and therefore comes in under slavery to sin, and the peculiar manifestation of sin that applies, the sin of pride, the sin of standing alone without the need for God, the sin of saying to the cross, it wasn't necessary, I'm good enough without it. The good person, like Cornelius, who really has a hunger in their heart, will come to Christ. The good person who simply has their own righteousness and does not want God, really, has therefore no hunger for God and fails the initial test of entering the kingdom. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So we find, as we look at Romans chapter 6, that Paul enjoins us first to reject the argument of cheap grace. He next tells us to recognize that the source of our true freedom is in slavery to God, in bringing our minds, our members, our totality to God, in living obedience. And then he says also that we are to recognize the final results of what happens to us when we are under the mastership of sin or the mastership of obedience unto Christ. By the way, just parenthetically, Paul makes a very fascinating statement in verse 17 where he talks about us having become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which we were committed, which shows that in the early church, New converts were very carefully instructed in the Christian faith because it was a standard of teaching. It was a body of truth. And they had literally been handed over to that body of truth. And from the heart, they had believed that. So even in the early church, there was that melting of the heart and the head. But now he says finally for us to realize the final results. Where is sin going? Verse 21, it is producing fruitlessness. It is producing shame. It is producing death. Fruitlessness in respect. What return did you get? What return? to the person who is without the righteousness of God. The return of fruitlessness is suggested by the book of Ecclesiastes, that unique book in Scripture which is there to show us the pondering of a good man as he examines life without the righteousness of God. And he comes up to the conclusion, after he has tried wealth, after he has tried aesthetic pleasure and cultural enhancement, after he has built great buildings, after he has had all the pleasure in the world, and after he has had a keen mind that applied itself to wisdom, when he has examined everything and he's become an old person, he looks at the emptiness of his life and he says, all is vanity, all is vanity, there is nothing that is gain. A man has nothing from his toil, vanity, vanity. That's fruitlessness. Paul also says that the life that is under bondage to sin is a life filled with shame. Verse 21, those things of which you are now ashamed. Qualities of sin which were articulated earlier when we looked at Romans chapter 1, the world which Paul is living in, the world which we're living in, in which he writes. Things that now as a Christian are unthinkable, which were then freely practiced. There is a qualitative change that has happened because Jesus has come into our lives. We're a different people. The end result of sin is death. But for the believer, there is something else. The wages of sin or the rations of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in verse 22, the return you get is sanctification and its end, eternal life. There's some things Paul never tires of repeating. Eternal life, Jesus Christ. Over and over again he comes to those kinds of themes. Where are we going and who are we serving? And the name of the Lord can never be said frequently enough in his teaching. If we are going God's way, we find that we are being made whole. We are being made healthy. We are being re-knit and refashioned in the image of God. Therefore, we can be described as being sanctified. And we also can look forward to the end. The, the logical outcome of our progression of development is eternal life. Eternal life is not to be thought of in the Scripture as something which happens to people who statically remain on a bump on a log and all of a sudden eternity and the good life and heaven crashes in upon them. But the Christian life is meant to allow that flowering and development of character and life where heaven just seems to be the natural step next for the development of that personality which is emerging after the work of Christ has been going on in the human heart. 
The kingdom of God is seed which is planted in the, in the soil. It is first seed, but it has potential, and it grows up, and it becomes a green blade, and the green blade becomes a stalk, and the stalk has ears, and it has grown. Its potentiality has been realized. The end is life. And Paul says, if we want that kind of an end, if we want life, then the clue and the key is to becoming slaves of God, to recognizing that all of life is under the totality and the ownership and the control of God. And our time and our efforts and our abilities and our lives are all His. We are like that figure in the Old Testament which is given to us, I think, as, a, as, as fittingly representative of what it means to be slaves of God. We're in Exodus chapter 21. When a slave had been in a household... Actually, a slave in the Old Testament sense, in the Hebrew sense, was a person who worked for maybe a seven-year contract or a six-year contract at time, sold himself out for six years to pay debts or make an income or whatever. At the end of that period of time, he could go free. He had earned his freedom. But if he wanted to remain in the household forever and not go out, he, he went to the owner and so informed him, and the owner took him to the doorpost of the house which showed that he knew where he belonged. And there was an awl, A-W-L, which was kind of like probably a great deal similar to an ice pick. And it was bored, and, and and the awl bored a hole in his ear to mark that person forever as a slave. It was the mark of love. That obligation did not hold that person there, but love did. Love for family, love for the owner. The awl had made its mark, and the ear was pierced. Because the ear is the instrument of hearing, and because it's the instrument of hearing, it is the instrument of obedience. And the mark on the ear suggests now that for life, this person has willingly committed their obedience to another. And so God wants his people to be marked, not in a physical way, as we have seen that rejected in the book of Romans, but marked in a spiritual way to obedience in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's look to the Lord now in prayer. As we come, Lord, to the conclusion of this verse 23 today in Romans, where the Apostle lays before us our alternatives, that sin brings death because that is an earned recompense for what we have done. But you, through Jesus Christ, bring us as a free gift eternal life. We're brought face to face once more with that whole issue which faces every one of us, that eternal divide, that yes-no, that heaven-hell, that question which puts us in one of two camps of humanity. We belong to Adam or we belong to Christ. We bear the image of the man of earth or we bear the image of the man of heaven. We're becoming unlike you or we're becoming like you. We see the contrast once more. Within our hearts, Lord, we rise up, therefore, again today to to treasure grace. To say that no matter how hard we could have worked, we never could have gotten anything but death because sin dwells in us. We could never be perfectly acceptable in, in your eyes because your love is so pure that no eye can behold it. But now in Jesus Christ, we who are under your wrath have now been brought under your love Grace has placed us there. We're in a position today of favor. All of us within this room who have confessed you as Lord and Savior are highly favored of you today. We can hear said to us by your Spirit what the angel said to Mary, highly favored one of God, because we too have been highly favored. We have been honored with the presence of your Son in our lives. We treasure that. We are under grace. Knowing that, Lord, therefore, we bring our will and our mind to you, and our members, those ways we express ourselves and live out our life, we yield them once more to you freshly, that we might be totally and completely from our heart obedient to the standard of teaching which has been committed us. That we do not spurn the grace of God or trample it underfoot or tread lightly upon it, but that we treasure it and magnify it And live obediently, not in order to fulfill the just demands of the law, but live obediently in order that we might show the deep response in our hearts of thanksgiving that is there because of what Christ has already accomplished for us. We praise you for freeing us from sin. Sin still around us, Lord. It is a nuisance to us now. It is a bother. But we praise you 
that because of your life, it is no longer in control. You are in control. And if we are in you, and if we are thinking other thoughts, if we are still feeling that sin has dominion over us when your word is saying it does not, then correct our thinking to bring it in line with you so that through faith we come to that same perception as you and therefore have the freedom that you want us to enjoy in our Christian life. Freedom not only from sin, but freedom from all the effects of sin, which include guilt and condemnation and fear. We thank you and we praise you for your great gift of love. If there be any here today that do not know you, let this be a drawing today to come to you and of their own free will, by an act of decision on their own. I pray, Lord, that that friend would act to respond to you and to receive you. We ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen.